Hello, this is Brother Denny. Welcome to Charity Ministries. Our desire is that your life would be blessed and changed by this message. This message is not copyrighted and is not to be bought or sold. You are welcome to make copies for your friends and neighbors. If you would like additional messages, please go to our website for a complete listing at www.charityministries.org. If you would like a catalog of other sermons, please call 1-800-227-7902 or write to Charity Ministries, 400 West Main Street, Suite 1, Ephra, PA, 17522. These messages are offered to all without charge by the free will offerings of God's people. A special thank you to all who support this ministry. I greet you all in the matchless name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This platform and this pulpit has already been mightily blessed of God this morning. Praise the Lord for the tremendous challenge that we received from Brother Abner. Great insight, not only into the Word of God, but also into our lives and our hearts. Thank you, Brother, for the great blessing you brought. You might call my message this morning, Where There Is No Vision, The People Perish. The question I want to ask this morning of us as his people and his servants is this. What do we see? Robert Jaffrey was a very wealthy, well-educated young man. Came, I believe, from Canada. He visited the land of Bonaire, one of the Antilles Islands, at that time a Dutch colony. And he found there, as we did, the stone huts near the ocean on the windward side, close enough so that they were subject to the ravages of the waves and the driving spray of any heavy wind. And there the slaves would dig trenches back from the ocean shore into the sands of the beach. And they would form their great pans, building the sand around so that the water, the seawater, when the tide came in, would flow up those trenches and fill those pans. Before the water could escape as the sea went back and the tide rolled away, they dammed those trenches so that the water could not escape and through the blazing sun throughout the day that water evaporated and left the salt of the sea water. The slaves then gathered that salt, bagged it, and placed it on ships headed for Europe. Jaffrey, as he watched those slaves, was brokenhearted. They must, he said, hear the gospel. He went to the Dutch government. He said, sirs, I wish to preach the gospel to the slaves that live there on the beaches gathering salt. And the government said, sir, that is impossible. For no one is allowed to communicate with those people and to live with those people but slaves. The only possible way you could reach those people with the gospel would be to sell yourself as a slave and live with them. And he did it. I did not know until very recently when a brother told me upon visiting the graveyards in the Antilles, particularly Bonaire and other of the islands, they discovered the gravestones of many a Moravian 
who had sold himself or herself into slavery and died as slaves because they had felt that God would have them reach the lost on that island. They, beloved, had vision. Bekonga Paul, our great apostle of his people in the jungles of the Congo, when captured by the rebels, they took him, they bent him back, bending them as, as a bow that is bent to launch an arrow until they could tie his wrist to his ankles with wet hemp ropes. They tied them tight. Those ropes, as they began to dry, began to shrink. They got tighter and tighter and tighter until his hands were like balloons, his feet like melons. They stomped him. They ripped the hair from his head. They said, Sir... If you do not deny this, Jesus, we are going to kill you. And in his agony, he looked into their faces. He said, you may kill me, but I will never deny my Lord Jesus Christ. How, beloved, did he see that way? Where there is no vision, the people perish. Now, the first thing that comes to our mind is the sight of our physical eyes. If we don't see them... If we don't recognize their presence, they're going to die without ever hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that passage studied, you discover that that vision is not the vision of our physical eyes. That vision, beloved, is an internal vision. It is a vision of the very heart. It is a vision that flames and blazes and illuminates and dominates the very nature and character of a person who sees. And that seeing is a biblical understanding, a correct understanding of the prophetic teaching of the Word of God. Oh, that God would help us to see. Now, we talked the other day about right brain languages. I'd like to try a little experiment with you this morning. I think some of us are able to see things like that. What Brother Abner was preaching, that's straight right brain. I mean, when he can envision those things and bring them out and align them with and match them to our present situation. He is seeing. He was living that passage and seeing those lepers and going out in the strewn paths of the riches and the weapons and the equipment of those Syrian soldiers as they ran from their lives from that God-induced and produced mighty wind and noise. He saw it. And I hope this morning that you'll be able to see. I would like to take this wall here, something like a screen, and try to paint a couple of pictures that are found in a glorious portion of the Word of God. They're described there, beloved, as things that are seen. Oh, it's so dark. It's so dark there in the deserts of Mali and Africa. So dark, beloved, that even though the sky, the black velvet of the sky is hung with the chandeliers of the stars, there's not enough night, light so that you can see where that dark velvet sky meets the horizon of those rolling sand dunes. Through that dark night, up a winding little desert river is coming a little wooden boat containing missionaries. Midnight passes, one in the morning, two, and at last the wooden hull of that little boat grates on the bank of that river and they have arrived. And suddenly against the sky, coming down that sand dune, they see the form of an Arab 
robed, carrying before him a lantern. He approaches at last to their boat, and leaning over, he illuminates that boat with that lantern, and seeing that these are Americans, and that they're missionaries, he screams in their face, What are you doing here? We don't need you here. We don't want you here. Get out of here. And that, beloved, is their introduction to their mission field. They climb that dune. They find a place to sleep in that little village. And the next morning, they, walking through the streets of the town, kind of reconnoitering where they're going to live, they hear a high-pitched voice screaming, screaming, and they work their way through the crowd, and they're standing on the corners, a young man screaming in a demented voice, and they ask, who is that? And they're told that that young man is the first person in our village to attempt to become a Christian. Our leadership caught him, and they buried him in the sand up to his neck. The ants began to gather, first by the hundred, then by the thousands, then by the uncounted millions. His head was a writhing ball of ants. They were streaming into his ears, up his nostrils, under his eyelids, into his mouth. And they drove him insane. And what you hear him screaming in that demented voice on the street corner are those Bible verses that he crowded into his heart in the first few days of His salvation. Beloved, oh, who could win souls, bring souls to Christ in a place like that, where there are indeed more missionary graves than there are converts to the Lord Jesus Christ. Ambassadors, you might say. Ambassadors for the King of the universe. Yes, beloved, ambassadors for the King of the universe. But wait, ambassadors that we find described in the fifth chapter of the second the book of Corinthians and verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. I read that verse, I thought, how thrilling. But then I noticed the first two words, now, then. Now you understand, as I mentioned, that right brain languages are pictorial. And because they are pictorial, they lack certain words. And because they are pictorial, beloved, it is difficult for a right-brained preacher to see it the parts of a passage. He sees one great truth. Listen to a black preacher. Almost always. He will take one truth, he will take a phrase, a word, and he'll embroider around it with glorious pictorial oratorical language. And as he does that, the people begin to come into the scene. They begin to live, live it, to, to smell it, to taste it, to hear it. And it's glorious preaching. But if you ask that same man to exegete that passage, he has difficulty because not thinking literally, uh, linearly, sequential thought, he has difficulty seeing the parts. And so when I understood that, I began to study the English language and I found that indeed there are certain words used by the Holy Spirit as signposts, as flags. Now then is one of those. Because, but, finally, like, like, uh, uh, likewise, uh, therefore, wherefore. Signs that the Holy Spirit gives us. Flags waving, saying, come here, follow along here. And He leads us, beloved, by following those signpost words to 
discover the subject of his passage, and then to discover the main uh, points that he wants to bring out, the context where he begins to teach on that subject and where he closes, his own illustrations and the Holy Spirit's own conclusions. And so when I found now then, I said, well, it must mean that there are some prerequisites, some requirements for being an ambassador. He must have laid out certain things in this passage before he declares, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. We get the idea sometimes that every Christian, by automatic appointment when he comes to Christ, is an ambassador. But no nation in the world sends any Tom, Dick, and Henry to be the ambassador. Someone has defined an ambassador as a high-ranking official who speaks on his own authority in the representation of his nation. And so we choose people of accomplishment. Now, they may be in the entertainment world or in the sports world or in the political world or in the business world or... Uh, but they have proved themselves that they are indeed capable of speaking for their nation. And so I began to search back through this passage, and I found indeed that there are at least four things that the Holy Spirit displays and explains here to establish who can be and how we as His servants can be indeed ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then as I discovered and studied it, I found that he uses also a very special word. That's in the Greek language, oida. First time I looked it up, I found that it meant to see. And in fact, I began to read. I read in chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we receive mercy, we faint not. But then I wrote, read down in verse 14, same word, knowing that He which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus. And I found again in verse 1 of chapter 5, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. And I found it again over in verse 11 of chapter 5, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And I wondered, how is it possible that a single Greek word can be translated both to know and to see? And then it dawned on me. Beloved, it means to know because you've seen it as an eyewitness. You can't be dissuaded of it. You can't be disabused of it. You can't be disillusioned of it. You can't be dissuaded that it wasn't so. I, you, you can't tell me it didn't happen that way. I saw it with my own eyes. It's that kind of seeing. Is that kind of deep seeing through the eyes of the Spirit that gives us such a vision that it becomes reality that can not be denied? We find the first of those things which we must see in verse 18 of chapter 4. While we look not, at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Is, is God asking us here for something that's impossible? How is it possible? How, beloved, is it possible for us to look upon things which are not seen. Hmm. Well, of course, the Bible, as you know, interprets itself, so we have only to look across the page at verse 4 to discover what he's talking about. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ to his image of God should shine unto them, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Now listen to verse 6. For God, who commanded the light,
to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What do we discover? We discovered that light is predicated, pardon me, sight is predicated on light. So far as we know, there's no creature in this world that can see without light. Now, you boys and girls may say, well, how, how about the pussycat? Well, the pussycat has very special eyes. The pussycat has eyes that can gather light. He can go outside and he can gather the starlight. He can gather the ambient light, those photons just floating around, reflecting off of the, off of the clouds from a nearby town. And that pussycat can use those lights to see in the dark. Our lights, our eyes don't work that way. We can't, we can't do it. But if you take that pussycat and put him in a room where there is no light, he's as blind as a bat. He can't see anything. He must have light to see. Sight, beloved, is predicated on light. And what happens? We find that we have two kinds of sight. We have physical sight. And light reflecting off of you into my eyes enables me to see you. And light reflecting off me into your eyes enables you to see me. But there's another kind of sight. That, beloved, is spiritual sight. And our spiritual sight, beloved, is enlightened by the teaching of the Holy Spirit of God. And what we're being called upon to do in verse 18 is to look upon the things that the God of heaven sees as eternal. Now, it's not very often that scientists and philosophers agree. But here they have. They have agreed that stability and reality are integrally connected. What would we say in plain English? We would say... They've agreed that if it does not last, it is not real. We have, beloved, in this Bible, the spiritual dictionary of the language of God to us in the English language. We have the Satharis of the grammar and the speech of the God of heaven. Now, if we take this book and we read through it from cover to cover, we discover something awesome. We discover, beloved, that God defines reality as that which lasts forever. And God declares in this book that if it does not last Forever, it is not real. The famous little Korean preacher, Billy Kim, I shared the pulpit with him one time in a conference, and he said, you know, I used to really enjoy it when people talked about that warm Korean preacher. I, he said, I enjoyed that until I looked up warm in the Korean dictionary. And it said, not so hot. <laughs> well, beloved, if you look up reality in the dictionary of the God of heaven, you'll discover that he defines reality as that which lasts for eternity. We might say, how in the world could any creature in the universe define it so narrowly? Because then the antonym of that is that which does not last for eternity by God's vision is not real. How in the world, why in the world would God define reality that way? But just think a little bit. Which way is north here? Is it truly that way? My compass doesn't work. Mankind has looked in the northern sky 
for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. He noticed long ago that there is up there in that area of the north no light. Not a single star in sight. We have turned the greatest telescopes in the world on that area. Mount Palomar, Mount Wilson, the new one out there in, in the Hawaiian Islands, and then the monster Japanese telescope with a mirror 32 feet wide. And those telescopes have gazed at that area. And they've yet to see, beloved, the slightest glimmer of light. And yet, their electronic ears, and that can be explained, won't take the time. Their electronic ears can hear the stars singing out there. And we have a God, beloved, who is out there and here at the same time. Scientists tell us if you were to turn on a laser beam at one end of the Milky Way, and that laser beam screaming across the sky at 186,282 miles per second would take 100,000 years to reach the other end of the Milky Way. And we have a God who steps it in a single step, if that. A God, beloved, who inhabits the infinite in reaches of the universe. Here and there, in the same moment when it takes light, 186,282 miles per second to reach out there. Is it any wonder then that a God who lives in eternity should define that which is real as that which lasts forever? The first thing he talks to us about in verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but of the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. What's he talking about? He's talking about measuring our lives, beloved, by heavenly time. Measuring our lives by the yardstick of the eternal. Measuring our lives by the reality of the grace of God and the love of God, and the glory of God, and the Word of God, and the mission of God, and the treasure of God, of the souls of men and women, boys and girls, across the world. That, beloved, is the reality of God. And that is the yardstick by which we must measure our very beings. Living, beloved, not by earthly time, but living by heaven, time. But there's something else. Let's go back to that, to that desert. It's daytime now. Look, 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 right up there, right up there, right against the horizon. It looks like ants crossing. Hmm, they've disappeared. No, they're coming closer. Those aren't ants, those are camels. That's the Berbers of the desert, those nomads. Look, look, they're going to make camp. That woman right there, right there, she's, she's getting down off her camel. She's reaching down in an, a bag. She's pulling something out. It, it looks like an old ragged cloth. Look, there she's spreading that cloth over a thorn bush. I can't believe it. That old ragged cloth spread over that thorn bush is her house. That's the only house she's ever known. She was born under a cloth like that. She had her babies there. She will die and be buried under an old ragged cloth spread over a thorn. Do you see that? If you do, beloved, you see chapter 5 and verse 1. For we know, for we see as eyewitnesses that if our earthly house of this tent were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Do you mean to tell me that the God of heaven looks upon this earthly life, upon the American dream in which we luxuriate, as nothing but a tent, nothing but an, an old ragged cloth spread over a thornbush? 
Now we have some pretty nice tents. I remember the first time I preached for Ed Johnson, First Baptist Church, Rosemount, Minnesota, south of Minneapolis. They put us up in a colony inn, newly refurbished. We opened the back door to go into that inn, and the smell of newness was there. I like that smell. We would walk down the carpeted hall, open the door into our room. Oh my, what a room. They not only had drapes over the windows, but they had lace over the drapes. And that carpet, beloved, that carpet, if you were to take your shoes off and not mark where you put them, you're about to lose a pair of shoes. <laughs> and we arrive at tents like that in chariots of steel, powered by the latest turbocharged V6 engines, silky smooth, electronically controlled transmissions, ABS brakes, traction control, seated upon leather or velour, surrounded by eight speakers of the latest digital stereo music. And we're supposed to believe that this American life is nothing but a tent? No. Nothing but an old ragged cloth? No. And God knew that. And so we find in verse 2 what he did about it. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tent do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, listen now, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. What is he saying here, beloved? Knowing that normally we would never see it. He has given us, along with the earnest of the Spirit, a very special gift. Now, we understand that it's through the Holy Spirit that we are brought into conviction of sin and judgment. We understand that the Holy Spirit is the one who brings us to the Lord Jesus Christ, to fall on our knees, broken, lost, and cry out for mercy and forgiveness. We understand that it's He who bursts us into the family of God through the miraculous new birth, the birth from above. We understand that He becomes our seal, the earnest of the Spirit. We understand that He baptizes us into the body of Christ and that He is our teacher to lead us into all truth. Those things we understand well, but seldom do we understand or think that He has another tremendously important mission to us, without which we will never see. And that ministry, beloved, is to teach us to groan. To teach us, beloved, to groan for real clothing. For we, in this we groan, earnestly, passionately, brokenly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If it so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked, we begin to look upon this earthly life as an unreality. The real clothing is the glorious robes of heaven. The real housing is the glorious housing of heaven. The real riches are the glorious riches of heaven. And so we groan in this tent. Not that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Tozer once wrote, He has set eternity in their hearts, said the preacher. And I think he here sets forth both the glory and misery of men to be made for eternity and forced to dwell in time is for mankind a tragedy of huge proportions. All within us cries for life and all around us speaks of death. And the Holy Spirit is given to teach us, beloved, 
to groan for reality. Real clothing. Real housing. Real riches. And when the God initiates that groaning along with the earnest of the Holy Spirit, and He works in our very beings, we begin to understand that this earthly knife is not to be coveted, not to be pursued, not that upon which we, we will spend our being. I was driving down the street in North Carolina, Greensboro, North Carolina, one day, and I heard a huffer and puffer. Anyone ever heard, ever heard a huffer and puffer? They're peculiar to the South. They preach like this. Brethren, uh, God is uh, going to bless us. Uh. I always turn them off immediately. But this man began to give an illustration. And that illustration so gripped me, beloved, that I was gripping the steering wheel of that car. If I had been stopped by an officer of the law, you'd have heard that Daryl Champlin, president of Independent Faith Mission, is in jail for assaulting an officer of the law. He told the story of a city here in the United States, a town, had a plaza in the center of the town, and in that plaza, a great spruce tree. And at Christmas time, the folks of that village would put presents for the children of the village under that tree, till at last the tree would be surrounded by great heaps of presents. And on Christmas Eve, the mayor would come and the people would gather with the children and the mayor would read the tags on the presents and give them to the children as a great time of rejoicing. A little boy came every year. They called his name Billy. He was not very bright. His parents never came. Billy never got anything. Sitting there watching all the other children got something, Billy never got anything. But this particular year, the first present was a big box right up against the trunk of the tree. And people passing wondered, for whom is that present and who in the world gave it? By Christmas Eve, the tree was totally surrounded with presents. The children and parents came, Billy came. And the mayor began to pass out the presents until all were gone but the big box. And the mayor walked back there and he looked at that box, looked at the tag. Billy, Billy, my boy, Billy, you've got a present. Billy, come and get your present. And that little boy shambled up, grabbed that big box, went back to his chair, popped it open. And it was empty. Some beast had given that little boy an empty box. Someday, beloved, we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And I wonder how many who have been deceived by this world into to pursuing the American dream, an unreal house, an unreal business, unreal possessions, unreal objectives, unreal goals by the determination and the definition of the God of heaven and will have spent their life on an empty box. There are, you know, several different generations every in the United States. We're talking in this church of chronological generations. And I see here probably four. I'm not looking directly at anyone here, but they're the little children. That's one generation. The mothers and fathers of those little children are the second generation. And then you have folks my age, the moms and dads of those parents, that's the third generation. And then looking over the congregation, I detect that it's possible that there are a few folks in the congregation here old enough to be my mom or my dad. And so we have in the congregation four chronological generations, that is, measured from the time of the birth of a person until they mature and have children. And that second generation follows them. 
But what is talked about in Scripture so often is not a chronological generation. It's a spiritual generation. And beloved, that generation is entered not by birth, but what we see is real. That for which we will give our money. That for which we will give our very being. That to which we give our thoughts. That to which we give our sight. That to which we give our heart. Back there, some years ago, we had the hippies. Remember? They saw reality as having... Doing your own thing. And in those days, some of you might be old enough to have been on an airplane in those days. We put on suits and ties to get on an airplane. They got in in their pajamas with backpacks. And they opened those backpacks in international airports, put up little tents, and created garbage heaps in international airport parking lots. Do your own thing, they said. Then along came the Pepsis. Now, Pepsis see reality as having a good time. You go across the America a year or two ago, there were stickers everywhere. Are we, am I having fun yet? Are we having fun yet? Have you ever lost your, your tan while being passed by an RV? I mean, we're cruising along the highway, along the interstate, and suddenly it gets dark. And there's, look up, and there's this wall passing us. And there's the bicycles on the front bumper, and sure enough, there's a boat up there. About a half a gallon later, we, that thing pulls even with us at the back, and, and there on the back bumper are the dirt bikes. Don't pull over, you're sure to have a wreck, they've got to be towing a car. Are we having fun yet? And there's a whole generation, beloved, packing the churches of America who have been caught up in having fun yet. The Pepsi generation, they're called. Drink Pepsi and you'll be slim and trim. If I believe that, I drink a case today. <laughs> and those folks have a prayer. It goes something like this. I would like three dollars worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I do not want enough of him to make me love a black man or pick beets with a migrant. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want the warmth of the womb, not a new birth. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I would like to buy three dollars worth of God, please. And you see people across America wearing... A little button. Put Jesus first. That's their prayer. Just give me a little bit. Not enough to let, love a black man or pick beets with a mic. Three dollars worth of salvation, please. But there's another, another generation, philosophical generation here in America, and it's the biggest, perhaps, called the yuppies. The yuppies believe that the American dream is the normal Christian life. We're now into the second generation. The children that I teach in the Bible colleges are coming out of families where their mom and dad have believed that. And they come into Bible college not to train for the service of the God of heaven, but to get that good education with which they can get that good job and buy that good home and marry that good mate and have that good security for their old age. And they have learned that if you know how to invest, you can start your old age security and enjoyment at about age 50. They too have a prayer. It goes something like this. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray my cuisinart to keep I pray my stocks are on the rise and that my analyst is wise. I pray that all the wine I sip is white and that my hot tub's watertight. I pray that rocket ball won't get too tough and that all my sushi's fresh enough. I pray my cordless phone still works and that my career won't lose its perks. I pray my radio, microwave won't radiate and my condo won't 
depreciate. I pray my health club doesn't close and that my money market grows. And God forbid, should I go broke before I wake, I pray my Volvo they won't take. That's their reality. There's reality to another group out there. They're called dinks. Double income, no kids. The man and wife both have 72 hour a week careers. They make appointments to meet several times a week. Someone wrote to a news magazine, best letter I'd ever seen to their editor. Said, don't worry about the dinks. Not having children, they'll soon be extinct. <laughs> amen and amen. <laughs> but there's another generation out there, beloved. A generation called ambassadors. And those ambassadors see treasure as the souls of men and women, boys and girls across this world. Amen. Those men and women see, those ambassadors see reality as the glories of the God of heaven, as the honor and grace and love of the God of heaven, as the treasure of lost souls, as a mansion in glory, as the things of eternity, the things of the reality of God. One such was Hudson Taylor. He wrote in his diary these words. Our dear little Gracie, how we miss her sweet voice in the morning. One of the first sounds to greet us when we woke and through the day and at eventide. As I take the walks I used to take with her tripping figure at my side, the thought comes anew like a throb of agony. Is it possible that I shall never more see the sparkle of those bright eyes or feel the pressure of that little hand? Yet she's not lost. I would not have her back again. I'm thankful she was taken uh, rather than any of the others, though she was the sunshine of our lives. I think I never saw anything so perfect, so beautiful as the remains of our dear child. The long silken eyelashes under the finely arched brows. The nose so delicately chiseled. The mouth small and sweetly expressive. The purity of the white features. Then her sweet little Chinese jacket and the little hands folded on her bosom, holding a single flower. Oh, it was passing fair and so hard to close forever from our sight. Pray for us. At times I seem almost overwhelmed with the external and internal trials connected with our work, but he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, and my strength is made perfect in weakness, so be it. Amen. Never, never, beloved, a word about quitting. After they buried Gracie, of course, Next to little Billy. Wasn't it their secretary that took the living children back again to the continent? An ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ. But we have some modern ones too. Dr. Robert Patton, internist and cardiologist, was hired by the United States government and sent to Liberia, West Africa, to start a hospital there, a teaching hospital. He was unsaved, religious but unsaved. And there he did establish a teaching hospital, created the entire curriculum, and was chief professor for five years. During that time, he was led to Christ by a missionary doctor in Liberia. He came back, joined the church in Berrien Springs, Michigan, began to serve the Lord, Moved then his membership down to a more vital church in South Bend, Indiana. And there I preached on a Wednesday night. In the meantime, and through all of this, he and other doctors had created a 16-doctor association. All Christians. They had built six clinics along the border between Indiana and Michigan. They had the hospital, the Ger Berrien Springs General Hospital. They were in total plan running that hospital. They had thousands of souls saved by dealing with them in their offices. If you stepped into their office, there was a poster there saying, your doctor is as interested in your spiritual health 
as he is in your physical health, and you will anticipate him speaking to you about the Lord Jesus Christ. So I preached in his church, and the next morning the telephone rang. It was our mission office. Call a Dr. Patton. He would like to talk with you. I picked up the phone and called him, and these were his first words. Brother Champlin, God called us to the mission field the right way last night. Please come and talk to us. And we talked with that man, and he ended up giving up his practice, selling his home, and coming to live in war-torn Suriname, South America on $900 a month. That man, beloved, is beside himself. That man, beloved, is indeed an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, that we would allow the Holy Spirit of God to teach us to grow for the things of reality. But there's more. Look, if you will, in verse 9. Wherefore, we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, seeing as eyewitnesses, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Now, beloved, this is not speaking, as you understand, of course, of the judgment, the great white throne judgment of Revelation chapter 20. This speaks of the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema. And here it is called the terror of the Lord. Why the terror? Because, of course, of the fire. First Corinthians 3 and 13 says, For it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Beloved, our God is a consuming fire. And our God is going to turn His blazing, scintillating, pulsating gaze upon my life and your life. Our Lord Jesus seated at one side as the judge. Daryl Champlin standing on the other side as that one being examined. And the blazing gaze upon my Savior and my God turned upon my life to reveal, beloved, every instant, every moment, every day, every week, in which my vision failed to be the vision of the things of the reality of God. And under that blazing gaze, all, beloved, that was lived, for the things of this earth, all that was lived without the great vision of the reality of the eternal things of the God of heaven is going to be burned up and turned to ashes on the floor of that judgment seat. God, of course, reveals Himself in fire all through Scripture, and that's a totally different subject, but there are several ways that I might mention to you. The blazing, fiery presence of the God of holiness is that which rejects all that His holiness rejects. And so those outside of the Lord Jesus Christ are under awful judgment that great fire of God also approves all that His holiness accepts. Moses in Exodus chapter 3 is a good example. God revealed Himself in a fiery bush. That was His approbation. This is my man. And then it purifies all that His holiness uses. There's Isaiah being purified by the fiery gaze and presence of the God of heaven and a coal of fire placed upon his lips. The goldsmiths in Suriname, South America, purify a lot of raw gold. A lot of nuggets are brought into them 
And I asked one of them, how do you purify this gold? And he said, we put this gold into a crucible, we light a burner under it, and as that gold melts, the, the gold sinks to the bottom, being heavier, and the dross comes to the surface. Says, then we have a special little sweep, and we sweep across the top of that gold, and we deposit it in another place where we might get a little more, and we keep sweeping that gold until we can look into that little crucible and see our faces reflected in the gold. And then we know it's pure. And so the fiery God of heaven purifies us purifies us, burning within us, burning away the dross until at last he can see the image of the Lord Jesus Christ in that goal, in that life. Verses 12 and 13 give the result. Here is a man, beloved. Here is a man who has begun to measure his life by the yardstick of the eternal. He's living now in heavenly time. Here is the servant of God who has come to recognize that this earthly life is nothing but a tent. Nothing but an old ragged cloth spread over a thorn bush. Not to be coveted. Not that to which he will pursue. Not that to which he's going to give his being. He's come to see in a glimpse into the future the judgment seat of Christ. And the blazing gaze of the Lord Jesus Christ turned upon his life to test whether or not he has lived for reality. And when he has seen those things, he declares, verse 13, For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God. Or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. Oh, again and again and again, God's man has appeared to be, to this world, to be beside himself. This congregation looks foolish to the world. What a bunch of fools that have left their style of life and they've committed themselves to sending people across the seas to reach people with the gospel and they're spreading their, their ideas around the nation and getting a little group here and a little group here and a little group here. What in the world are they doing? Beside ourselves, beloved, it will always appear so when we truly begin to see reality. But there's one more thing with which we must close. Verse 14. Not only must we see and live in reality, the reality of heavenly time. Not only must we see this earthly life as nothing but a tent. Not only must we look forward, beloved, to that day when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ and have our vision of reality tested by His blazing presence and gaze. But we must also see the reality transformation that takes place when we look at the love of Christ. Verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but in, unto them him which died for them and rose again. The result of this in Paul's life was to see a new realm. To see a new reality to see new relationships, wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. To see a new realm in the Lord Jesus Christ, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And it's all wrapped up in a single word that we find in verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Now some would some would define that love as that constraining as something like the vast pipes that somehow channel the 
thrust of water from a great dam. We have been, we stood close to those great pipes at Hoover Dam in Nevada. And the, the ground just vibrates. The whole, the whole dam vibrates at the power of the thrust of that water through those culverts. But constrained is also a wrestling term. My father, when before he was married, was a professional boxer. He taught my brother and myself to box in the living room of our home. He boxed when the man who was still standing took all the money. And he was a man about six foot one, enormously strong, in fact, so strong that when I was twelve, he said, Son, take hold of my finger, and he twirled me over my head, over his head on that finger. This man was strong. He said if, in boxing, if he had a man with a good right hand and that man did not go down, he'd go around behind him to see what was holding him up. And here he is in the living room with, up with big fat gloves and he is teaching my brother and I to box to my mother's horror. And he's saying, son, I'm going to faint with the left and I'm coming with a right cross. I would see the left, but I never saw the right. Boom! I'm down, I'm, no, oh, the world's just going round and round, nothing but stars floating around there. Son, get up. Get up, son. I told you, you don't wash my fist, you wash my chest. You'll see the punches starting in my chest. Now, let's try that again. Boom! But I did learn. I did learn. And in fact, it was kind of fun when the big bullies in the high school tried to pick on me. Someone out there said, make my day. But up the street from us, lived an Italian family. Their name was Caputo. The big brother was clear out of our class, much older, and he was round like a barrel. We called him Big Lard. The little brother was about our height, our age, but same shape. He was round like a barrel. We called him Little Lard. Now, boxing, Little Lard was a lot of fun. He always fell for the faints. He was just like a human punching bag. But one day he enticed me into a wrestle. How he ever deceived me, I don't know. Oh, what a battle. We were on the grass, as you know, children, we were turning red, green. He was on me, he was off, he was on me, he was off, he was on me, he was off. And last he's sitting right here and he's got his finger in my face and he's saying, Say uncle, say uncle. No champion ever said uncle. Off he went. On he came, off he went, on he came, and at last, beloved, I'm dead. Say uncle. And I said it. And I tell you, beloved, even today, if we meet again, there's going to be a rematch. <laughs> but that's what happens when we see the love of Christ. When he gazed upon that glorious one, his face so beaten we can hardly recognize him. His visage marred more than any man. His back torn until the bones can be seen. That gruesome crown of thorns and the blood streaming down and the spikes and the spear wound in his side. And we look at that love and we begin to comprehend it. And he reaches down and he wraps his mighty arms around us and he crushes us to himself until we cry, Uncle Lord, Uncle, oh my God, to any place at any cost, Uncle, my Lord, Uncle. And when that happens, beloved, old things pass away and all things become new. Look at him. Who is he? El Elyon, the master of the universe. He passes Pluto and he bows to him. He passes Uranus and he pauses in his orbit. He passes the Pleiades and they sing to him. And then he arrives near the ramparts of glory and the majestic angels rise to cry, Lift up your head, O ye gates, and be ye lift up ye everlasting doors. And our king shall come in. Then he comes to earth and stands before puny Pilate. 
And Pilate says to him, Do you not understand that I have the authority of life and death over you? And he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. And instead he chose to hang on an old, rugged wall. When we see that, beloved, we cry, Uncle Lord, Uncle, Uncle. Now I trust, beloved, that you've seen reality and have decided to measure your lives by the yardstick of the eternal and live by heavenly time. That you've, you've turned your life, your eyes upon this earthly life and you've seen that it's nothing but an old ragged cloth spread over a thorn bush, not to be pursued, not to be lusted after, not that upon which you will spend your being. And then you've caught a glimpse of the judgment seat of Christ when you will stand as I will before that glorious Lord and the blazing gaze of His eyes will make plain for the universe to see whether or not we live for the reality of God. And then we caught a glimpse of the Lord Jesus Christ hanging on Calvary's cross and His arms have wrapped around us and we've cried, Uncle Lord, Uncle, no price too high to pay, no life too hard to live, no death, too much to die. Uncle, Lord, Amen. Uncle. If you've seen those things, beloved, I invite you to be ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, bless now this portion of thy word to our hearts. A message haltingly spoken, O oh God. But I pray that you will vouchsafe it to our thoughts. Take your word, O oh God, and burn it into our very being. Help us, Lord, to see. To see, O oh God, reality. Only that which lasts for eternity. To see, O oh Lord, that this life is nothing but a tent, nothing but an old ragged cloth spread over a thorn bush, not to be coveted, not to be pursued, not that upon which we are to spend our being. To see, Lord, the judgment seat of Christ. And allow the Holy Spirit to teach us to grow for the things of eternity that it might be proved before Him that we indeed allowed Him to teach us and we have indeed grown. And then, Father, that we might look upon the Lord Jesus Christ in wonder, amazement, and awe and that His love would birth, O oh God, within us the cry. O oh Lord, no regrets, no retreat. O oh Father, we might indeed give our very beings to Thee. We ask and we pray and we plead with Thee. In the blessed name of the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> kind of makes you feel silly, doesn't it? <coughs> what you've done with your life. <clears throat> what we've done with our precious time. Where we've had our focus kind of makes you feel silly. 
when you begin to see. I think I'll end with the question that Brother Champlin gave us at the beginning of the message. What do you see? What do you see? You know, what you see today is where you will be five years from now in reality, in your life. That's the way God moves us from where we are to where He wants us to be. He lets us see. If we will walk in that which we see, we will live in it <clears throat> five years from now. But I wonder what you see. And I take that challenge to my own heart. What do I see? I thank God for the message. What a challenge to our hearts. Amen? We have a few minutes here this morning. We haven't done this all weekend. It just didn't fit. But it fits this morning. So I want to open the meeting up just a little bit. Maybe you have something to say. We're not looking for a sermon. We had one. But maybe you have some response to the sermon. I believe that would be a blessing to the rest of us. If somehow you could respond to the things that God has been dealing with your hearts about. Is, does anyone have anything that you feel God leading you to share? A response. If you do, would you raise your hand and we'll, we'll get a microphone to you. All right. I thank God for the message this morning and the challenge to, to see. Brother Chaplin uh, read there in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 3. If so, be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Here I saw Adam. When God was looking for Adam and he was hiding and he responded, I'm naked. I'm naked. Who told you you were naked? I saw Adam's nakedness, his sin, his disobedience to God. But I see my nakedness my sin, my disobedience to God. And I also saw Adam clothed, clothed, for he was clothed in righteousness, in the, in the righteousness of God. For when he walked with God there in the cool of the evening, when he talked with God, he was one with God. And I see that God is calling me to walk with him to be one with Him, so that when our Lord Jesus Christ come, I would not be found naked Amen, brother. in the things of this world, in my work, in my house, but that I be found clothed in His righteousness. And that's what the Lord showed me this morning, that I need to be dressed in His righteousness. Thank you, brother. Get a microphone here and one down here. I got to thank God for messages as we have heard this weekend. You know, I've been deeply challenged. And it was said once during these messages, we may not all be able to go into the mission field. But I thank God 
I might be crippled, but I can go to my knees Amen, and pray for those on the mission field. Yes, you can, Marlon, and you can have a vital ministry on your knees, though you cannot go in your body. May God help you do that. I'd like to ask us to sing 374, but to sing it as a prayer. To sing it as a real consecration. Okay. Number 374. <clears throat> I've been and my whole family been blessed tremendously for being here and I'd just like to underscore the point that he made this morning on being constrained by the love of Christ for doing what we do uh, that I think I want to make my motto in life that whatever I do it might be out of a motivation because of a love for Christ and what he done for me and and I thought of a of a J Hudson Taylor in, in interviewing two young men to go to the mission field, ask them what the motivation is for going and one of them said uh, because of the Great Commission and the other one said that uh, souls are dying and they need to hear and he said, he said, uh, you won't make it on that. He said, uh, when the hard times come, he said, if you are not constrained by the love of Christ, you won't make it and, and I took that deep to my own heart as a challenge that that everything that I do might be done being constrained by the love of God and also going back to the message last night I, that was such a powerful message uh, as far as being a job a lighthouse to wherever we are a holding back the evil uh, in the areas that God has called us to be and, and just being here in this community again my my burden and and heart have been greatly stirred for the old order people. I think it was probably about a year ago that I I felt the Lord asked me to release them. I had them on my heart for years ever since I was converted at the age of 18 and tried to do different things that, that the gospel might break through to those groups, specifically the old order Mennonite and even among them there's some more specific groups that I could mention but but just last night and this morning I feel God stirring and doing something again in my heart for them and I'm not sure what to do with it but I guess I would like to just just ask you to those of you that are here I'm a thousand miles away now maybe God would call one of you here to be a job to the old order of uh, people groups here in Lancaster County who will tell them who will tell them about the freedom of Jesus Christ right here in our midst in your midst uh, so pray for me as I try to discern what God is asking me to do because uh, I'm stirred again for my own family and my friends and, and those people that I know and love, but feel that God had asked me to lay that burden down because I'm a thousand miles away. But they need Jesus. They need the Job. They need someone to, to truly set them free. Someone here in the front? All I can say is, after a weekend like this, that I feel like the servant of the man of God, Elisha, suddenly seeing in a new way the the hosts out there and the, the real things of this world, I mean, the real things of this life. And I was just 
pondering it last night and this morning and just pondering it. What a responsibility I have. God has been so merciful once again just to to let us see these things. And what a responsibility I have to let him have my life to do something about this. And Brother Darrell was talking about being crushed and constrained. And I just want to thank God publicly for crushing me in the past year. He had to rip money out of my hands. I mean, he just had to pull that thing right out away from me. And he had to pull away my ideas of where I wanted to go on the mission field. And he had to do so many things like that. There's still more to do, but I just wanted to thank God for constraining me and crushing me and bringing me to a place where he can use me. Mm. Thank you, Jeremy.